Hello everyone, my name is Alian Firewala and today uh, we have a very special guest, uh, Mr. KK, our teacher is to, uh, and cyberpunk visionary in, the, in this interview we will learn about his unique brand of art and technology, his view on important social movement and his vision for the future. So hello Mr. KK, how are you? Hey, what's going on Alian? Thank you for having me on your podcast. And uh, if it's okay, before we start, I made you a little video that I want to play. Yeah, sure. It's okay? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I, I hope that you can hear this well and your guests can hear it well. And if not, I'll send you the audio file, okay? Okay, okay. <laughs> और मैं आज आप सबके साथ होने के लिए गहरे मोहब्बत और परजूश हूं मैं एस्ट्रिन वेंकुवर की रंगीन कम्युनिटी से आ रहा हूं और मैं फोटोग्राफी डिजिटल हिकमत अमली सोशल मीडिया की पीर भी और ज्यादा मैं महारत रखता हूं मैं डिजिटल मार्केटिंग क्रिएटो टेक्नोलॉजी और कैसे प्लेटफार्मर्स जैसे फायर की मदद से एक क्रिएटो अजीम हयात की रहائش के दरवाजे खोलने के बारे में कुछ हुक्मत तजुर्बा और इल्म शेयर करने के लिए इजाजत दें डिजिटल मार्केटिंग हम डिजिटल मार्केटिंग से शुरू करते हैं एक शाबा जो सिर्फ एसईओ और पीपीसी इश्तेहारात से ज्यादा है डिजिटल दौर में यह अहम है कि आप एक जामा मार्केटिंग हकमत अमली तैयार करें जो आपके ऑडियंस को इन कहां हैं ऑनलाइन पहुंचाए फायर और क्रिएटिव टेक्नोलॉजी अब फायर की बात करते हैं यह एक शानदार मार्केट है जो कुदरत और मांग के درمیان पल बनाता है आप ग्राफिक डिजाइन से लेकर वीडियो एडिटिंग की خدمات पेश कर सकते हैं एक क्रिएटो अजीम हयात की रहائش क्रिएटो अजीम हयात की रहائش के लिए अपने जज्बात और महारतों को मिला करें प्लेटफार्म्स जैसे फायर आपके अफकार के लिए टेस्टिंग ग्राउंड के तौर पर काम कर सकते हैं जबकि सोशल मीडिया आवामी राय के लिए एक बारोमीटर के तौर पर काम कर सकता है कैन यू हियर दैट Yes, it's wonderful. How you speak Urdu? Uh, well, there, I have a member of my family who speak, speaks Urdu, but um, this is not me. This is an AI clone of me. I built it yesterday for your class. That's great. It's video you on your Facebook profile. Uh, I haven't posted it yet. That's why I was a little bit late for our meeting. I was just putting the finishing details on it. Okay, sure. That's great. Thank you so much. Okay, sir. So before moving on a question, can you please introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Chris Krug. I live in Vancouver, Canada, and I'm an artist. And I, uh, I've been building the internet for a very long time. I built my first website when I was about your age, 16 years old. And uh, I've been building things through the Web 2.0 revolution, blogging and YouTube. And then again here through like blockchain, Web3, and AI. Wow, that's great. Awesome. Okay, sir. So my first question in your screen, uh, can you describe your journey from being a teacher to become a visual sage and cyberpunk anti-hero from the future? Mm -hmm. Um, this is a bit of a joke, and I can see that it's being lost in translation a little bit. What I'm trying to speak to here is my multidisciplinary nature of my art. So I'm really just trying to say here that while I'm like an independent creative guy, I'm a thought leader on these uh, these topics or whatever. So the the uh, description tech artist, quasi sage, cyberpunk, anti hero from the future. You should stick that in Google and have it translated for you because it's kind of a joke. Wow, that's great, wonderful. Thank you so much for this wonderful answer. Okay, sir, so my next question is, how do you envision the role of technology is in shaping the future and what are you concerned about it? Well, it seems that the rate of technological progress and change is moving faster than ever before. And um, it seems like it's changing everything around us, you know, uh, with, um, 
some of the experiments I just showed with you, with my ability to clone my voice and clone my video, make myself speak in almost any language. It really changes uh, my own perception of myself and my identity and my power. And I think that is also going to uh, change how I relate to, you know, my community and my family, my work and stuff. And so, you know, I believe we're going through a bit of a creative renaissance right now where things that have been impossible are now possible. And it remains to be seen what the outcomes of that are for the future. Um, in terms of my concerns, well, you know, my main concerns are that... Um, as we embrace these new ways of thinking about ourselves and our communities that we lose some of the traditional lessons that we've learned along the way that make us up who we are. So I think um, one example is we always thought that creativity was a part of what it meant to be a human being. <laughs> and we thought that the robots and the AI would come for the factory jobs first. But in fact, they are very creative and they're coming for the creative jobs. And it makes a lot of people wonder, what does it in fact mean to be human in an age where machines can do things better that we thought were traditionally only for humans? Exactly. That's great. Wonderful. Uh, so what inspired your interest in intersection of technology, art and citizenship? Uh, I went to university in 1995 and I lived in the English as a second language dormitory. And there was a bunch of guys from Seoul, Korea there. And I had never heard of the internet before, but I went into my dormitory to make some new friends. And I met these guys and they were building personal homepage. And so they taught me about personal homepage when I was just 16 years old. And I started building web pages for my professors and my universities and all sorts of things like this. And so that got me started down the road of building a digital advertising agency. And so I've always been interested in the intersection of technology and community and artistic expression. Wow, that's great. Wonderful. OK, sir. So how do you incorporate indigenous perspective and the land back movement into your work and vision for the future? Well, Alian, this is a very interesting question and it's very specific to the situation I live in here in North America. So a tiny little bit of a history lesson and pardon me world where I go off track, but, um, you know, white people moved to America and they thought it had nobody in it, but it was actually full of brown people, Native Americans. But the guy, Christopher Columbus, he thought he landed in India, so he called them Indians. And then, you know, over the course of the next few hundred years, they began to systematically oppress the indigenous people of North America. So... Now our consciousness has evolved and our understanding has deepened. We've left some of the religious bullshit behind. And so now we come to a part of our history where we're trying to make things right. And so in Canada, we talk about reconciliation. And what this means is that the imperial colony oppressors and the indigenous oppressed, they come together and they acknowledge the historical wrongs that have taken place. And they agree that these things did in fact take place, that there was truth there, and that we need to take steps to move forward. And in America, one of the areas that this truth and reconciliation happens is not only with the indigenous people, but also with the African black people who were brought to America as slaves long ago. America is trying to move forward and understanding how to move past those things is, uh, is, is very important. So in Canada and in America, we have the land back movement. And this is an idea that, you know, to truly reconcile with the indigenous people of this uh, continent, uh, you know, people need to essentially return stolen lands to the people that have been dispossessed. And... In many cases, that's not 
practical because people have built stuff there, you know, skyscrapers, cities, whatever. But in situations where the land cannot be given back directly to the indigenous people, financial compensation should be given in the courts. And so I am living on stolen native land. I am involved with people who are working to return the land and the languages to this region. And um, I support those efforts uh, philosophically, but also practically, you know, I, I do what I can in terms of volunteering and activism to help with that. How much of that makes sense to you? Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay, that's great. Okay, sir. So my next question is, uh, ACAB stand for all caps are bested. Can you elaborate your on your perspective on his slogan and uh, its inflection for society? Absolutely, Ali. And thank you so much for asking me that. I think it's so ironic that this interview is happening with a Pakistani teenager on these topics that I care so much about here in uh, Canada and America. So all cops are bastards, a cab. What is to be said about that? Um, I'm a bit of a revolutionary. I have a counterculture approach to a lot of things, including democracy and corporations and other stuff. So um, at the heart of that, I see the that there is a corruption um, from the top down, systematic corruption within the police force that reinforces racism and oppression of marginalized people and voices. I believe that that uh, corruption is systematic and when it's uncovered, it's often hidden and attempts to it attempts to uncover it are often um, disingenuous and um, not what they appear to be. So, you know, I think that there aren't a lot of good cops. I think that uh, a cop that maybe started off for the right reasons will be either brought to heel by the other cops and the corruption of the fraternal brotherhood, or they'll quit. They'll get frustrated. They'll see how things are on the inside and they, and they won't be able to um, to remain. So I, this is a hard topic to talk about. Every person has a family member who's a quote unquote good cop. But, uh, when it comes to the ACAB movement, um, you know, we talk about one apple will spoil the whole pie. Um, you know, if I make you a, a pie and most of the ingredients are good, but one thing is rotten. Well, by the time I cook it, the whole pie will be rotten as well. Wonderful, sir. That's really awesome. Great. So, sir, in the realm of teachers, what are some of your most ambitious and groundbreaking projects of work? Uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, some of the work that I'm the most proud of is building independent media centers at major world events. And this was something that I got to present on um, at the United Nations uh, Youth Summit in Mali, Africa. I got to present with the uh, Crown Princess of Norway, Marie Mati. And I was talking about uh, building citizen journalism ad hoc, ground up uh, media centers at world events for citizen journalists and bloggers and other um, independent media. and. Um, we did this at uh, a few major events. I did it at the Democratic National Convention in 2008 in Charlotte, North Carolina, America. And there I got to photograph Bill Clinton and Barack Obama. We essentially accredited 5,000 independent journalists through a self-accreditation and badge printing process that by nature of the critical mass of people that we assembled there, we were able to essentially the accreditation became valid by the very nature of us all applying for it, wearing it and using it. Um, and so I also was able to do that at the, uh, the Copenhagen Climate Change Summit, COP15, where world leaders assembled to 
hammer out a deal related to climate change treaties. And, um, you know, there was a, a lot of pressure from journalists and the media to hold the politicians and their promises, um, hold them accountable for those things. And the only people that uh, really could do that were the non-corporate media. So we invited the world there, um, bloggers and citizen journalists. We rented a space. We hosted a lot of events. And uh, by very nature of us uh, coalescing into a group and um, declaring our intentions and our our uh, the fact that we were um, you know part of the situation, that we de facto became a part of the situation. And lots of other things too, man, but that's like just the tip of the iceberg. That's great, wonderful. Thank you so much for this wonderful answer. Okay, sir. So my next question is, uh, could you share a glimpse of the cyberpunk world, your envision for the future and how it might differ from our current reality? Yeah, man. Well, I, I did touch on it a little bit earlier when I was talking to you about those um, video clones and how they're changing my sense of personal power and self and my relationship to my community and the world at large. But um, I also see us uh, entering into a, 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 a an age of creative renaissance where things that um, haven't been possible are, are possible. Um, I believe that it's not going to happen while the technological change is going to happen really quickly and it's already happening really quickly, like at an astronomically neck breaking pace, um, our human bodies and our minds are not, uh, moving at the same pace of innovation or technological evolution. So our understanding of ourselves and our communities and each other is very much traditional and yet our tools are very much futuristic. And so this creates a tension, you know, a pulling apart of society where like very soon, man, we're not going to know who to trust. Like for all I know, you might be an AI, you know, like yesterday, my video was an AI and so many people didn't know, like even you thought I spoke Urdu, right? So what's it like in a world where you can never trust any communication ever again if it wasn't made right in front of your eyeballs you know well, wh where does that leave us and like we're supposed to trust the government we're supposed to trust our leaders we're supposed to trust the media but i don't know how that happens anymore because all these things can be faked or spoofed or changed and modified manipulated you know um and so it, it it really remains to be seen how how that will affect us and how we're going to to navigate that and so i guess what i'm trying to say is because technology is changing fast but our bodies and minds are changing slow there's probably going to be some chaos for a while and it may take a few generations going to the other side leaving us you know and the younger people with their new minds and new brains coming up and using these new tools in ways that people like me i'm 45 years old that's old these days you know these tools are moving fast and quickly and as much as i'm on the cutting edge there's things that only people like you will ever be able to understand i just won't ever be able to wrap my minds around it so i think change will happen fast on one hand in terms of technology but in terms of progress humanity's progress i think that will lag behind as our minds and our bodies catch up now that being said I am very optimistic both about the present and the future. I know that there are many obstacles and challenges that face us. However, I believe there's more people that are educated, more opportunities for women, people live longer, people understand the interconnectedness of all humanity in a way that they've never understood before. So I think there's never been a better time to be alive and that it's exciting and that we're moving quickly in a forward direction. But I think there's gonna be some chaos between now and then. Like the changes that AI brings will be great, but they won't all be great. There will also be some challenging things. That's great, wonderful. So sir, in the context of 
420 movement how do you view the interaction of technology cannabis and social advocacy uh thank you my young pakistani friend uh here in canada we have legalized cannabis and marijuana and many people of my age use it as a way to relax and not feel anxiety and um doing so has popularized alternative medicines in a way that's probably pretty important like there's a lot of um the drug companies in America, the pharmaceutical companies, even the medical companies in America, they're all run for profit. They're not run for the health of the people or for progress, for humanity. They're run uh, essentially just to make dollars. And uh, when uh, health businesses and hospitals and doctors are all run purely to make profits, uh, whether or not they make you healthy or not is maybe a second priority, you know. So our ability to take our health into our own hands has become important, and many people are doing it. Um, and so in Canada, we have 100% full cannabis, cannabis legalization, and it's it's created a whole bunch of interesting companies and economics as well, people opening stores and restaurants and cafes and other businesses related to this. And uh, for guys like me, it's um, it's a pretty trippy new world because, you know, for 35 years or whatever, I went around uh, with my head down because that was an illegal activity. But now they've changed it. It is now legal and I'm OK. And so everything's different now. That's great. Wonderful. So nice. Okay, sir. So my uh, last question is, uh, what next on reason for Mr. Chris and what project on initiative are you currently focused on that we should watch out for? Yeah, man. Hey, once again, I just want to say thanks so much for reaching out to me. I don't know how you found me, but I consider you a new young friend. And I hope people from your school watch this video and tell them they can connect with me, too. I'd be happy to talk to them. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really cool to meet you. OK, I got a lot of interesting stuff I'm working on, man. Um, I am working on my podcast and my video blog and my newsletter and my website. But my real vision and my passion for the future is i want to have an event a festival related to my interests around creative technology and community and art so i want it to be like a business and technology event but i wanted to have the feeling of a festival like a music festival like south by southwest or something like that and i wanted to have the ethos and the spirit of burning man built into it as well where there's no hierarchy and there's not a stage with speakers on it and an audience with attendees but everybody brings something to the table they're either documenting the talks giving the talks helping out in some other way there's only participants there's no consumers of the event so a working title krugfest i'd love to do an event or a series of events or maybe even like a maybe like a membership club like dent or ted or something like that and then i'm also organizing a series of community events for the vancouver artificial intelligence community here in british columbia canada i've been going to all the smaller events meeting the organizers meeting the communities and inviting them to be a part of a a big open inclusive um ai vancouver community meetup event so yeah that's some of the stuff that i'm working on that's great wonderful okay sir so i am again very thankful to you to come in my show and sharing your knowledge and sharing your experience with us i hope everybody learned something new with your experience with your talk thank you so much sir again hey alan is it okay if i interview you a little bit sorry can i interview you sure why not anytime would you please introduce yourself yeah, sure. My name is Alian Firewala and I am the student of Prehan School Kurangi campus in the class Future Navigator and my goal is to become 
a Fiverr expert and teach other how we can earn minimum five hundred dollar per month using Fiverr. Yeah, man. Are you using Fiverr now? And what type of services are you providing? Graphic design. Okay, you're a graphic designer. You have yes. how many clients? No, it's my static journey. Uh huh. Very good. And uh, what kind of businesses do your friends have? Um, not a business. It's just a skill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What kind of skills on Fiverr are your friends selling? Uh, not all are in Fiverr. Someone are on a remote job. Uh, someone are on Upwork. Yeah. Which one is the best? In my opinion, Fiverr. Yeah. Uh, do you also do photography? No. How about AI photography? No, I don't know. From where do you get your images to use in graphic design? Sorry? From where do you get your images to use in your graphic design? I use Canva. Ah, of course. I use Canva also. Yeah. It's very powerful. Where do you live? Uh, your microphone turned off. Where do you live, Alan? Alien? Pakistan, Karachi. What's it like in Karachi? Uh, what I like in Karachi? Oh no! What is Karachi like? What's it like to live in Karachi? Because Karachi is my hometown, and Karachi is famous because. Uh, Karachi food is famous. Yes. yes. Tell me about Karachi food. Is it spicy? Uh, some spicy, some um, some spicy, some non-spicy. But uh, the famous uh, dish of uh, Karachi is biryani, and biryani is very spicy. Oh, I love biryani. I make it at my wow. house. Lamb, lamb biryani. That's good. Hey, can I tell you one story before we go? Yeah, sure, sure. Last night I went to a class called Internet Masterminds and there was four people pitching their ideas and it was a competition. And the guy that won the competition, he was from Pakistan and he was making some hilarious jokes, man. He was so funny. So this guy, his name on Instagram is Mr. Abdulio. M R A B D U L I O, Mr. Abdulio. So he's a Pakistani guy. Last year he made 50 million US dollars selling classes online, coursework and classes, masterclass, this kind of thing, online learning modules. He made 50 million dollars US dollars last year. Pakistani guy met him last night. That's great. The people are just stars. Yeah, man. You start with 500 US dollars per month and then you get 50 million US dollars per year. Exactly. All right, Alan. Thank you so much, man. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. It's great time to talk with you. Thank you so much again. You're welcome. Send me the original files and the links when you have them, please. Okay. Over now, Tintin.